Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Justin Kampf and I have a PhD in exercise and health sciences. Now, what I do for work is I work as the fitness director for WW Clinic, which is involved with uh, prescribing GLP-1 medications to people who aid in their weight loss efforts. And recently I was sent this Instagram clip by a buddy asking me what I thought about it. And I'll read out what it says, but what was a little bit concerning was the big following that this person has considerably more than me, uh, along with the misinformation that this person was, was presenting. And so this person has 1.4 million followers and what they said on this this post basically was the bottom line is there's no shortcuts to health. You may lose weight quickly with the help of medications like Wagovi, Saxenda, Manjaro, or Ozempic, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're improving your health, which is actually completely wrong because all of the research on, on these papers shows in dramatic improvements in, in metabolic health markers. But this person also writes that, in fact, the evidence that I'm seeing suggests using these meds could actually cause long-term harm to your health in some cases. Now, I'll take, he put it together several different points. I'll, I'll share them and then I'll basically say why he's wrong on just about all of these points. So the first point that this person made was he said, number one, it's just not necessary. The average weight loss in studies is 15.8% over 68 weeks. I said for the average obese woman, that's 27 pounds. And what this person says is you could easily lose that in six months with small lifestyle changes. Now, aside from 68 weeks being a totally different number than six months, this is just not supported by any research whatsoever. So what I'll do is uh, part of a research paper that I did, which is a meta-analysis, it looked at, basically we compare people that are just on a caloric deficit, so on a diet versus people that are on a diet and also doing things like resistance training. And I'm just gonna pull some information from there because you can see what's the typical weight loss from just diet alone. And I'll also share just a more robust review from obesity as well. But this first uh, paper was titled, Effects of Exercise Type During Intentional Weight Loss on Body Composition in Adults with Obesity. And so we had data points for this study at six months and then also at uh, 18 months as well. And so what happened in this study is the caloric deficit that was prescribed was 330 kcal reduction per day. So that should result in about a pound of weight lost per week. And when you look at what, what actually happened here is the, the weight loss was about 4.6 uh, kilograms. And this was in, in just the weight loss alone trial. But then if we move over to looking just at those individuals that that lost, um, that were just how much body weight did they lose at six months, it was 6.2 kilograms. And at 18 months, it was 5.3 kilograms. And that was about a 10% uh, overall reduction in weight loss. So definitely not uh, the number that that person said, and that was six months and 18 months. And also not not near nearly 15%. So the next one is exercise attenuates the weight loss induced reduction in muscle mass in frail obese adults. Now in this case, these individuals lost close to about 10 kilograms of, of their body weight in the diet only group. And what that translated over to if we look at their their starting weight, which was 102 kilograms. Now that's that's 10%. So again, that's not 15% of weight loss. Okay. This is from obesity. It's an expert consensus, uh, basically just looking at all of the research out there. And this is just worth basically reading out what came from that article, because this focuses on intensive behavioral lifestyle interventions. And they say the most effective behavioral weight loss treatment is an in-person high intensity, which is 14 sessions in six months, comprehensive weight loss inter intervention provided in an individual or group session by a trained interventionist, the principal component of an effective high intensity on-site comprehensive lifestyle intervention include 
prescription of moderately reduced caloric diet, a program of increased physical activity, and the use of behavioral strategies to facilitate adherence to the diet and activity recommendations. And basically what they say is in this six month period that results in about eight kilograms of, of weight loss. So that's like 18 pounds. So definitely less than 27 pounds. And that approximates to five to 10% of initial weight loss. So anywhere in between um, like uh, five to 10% uh, less than what was shown in those, those semaglutide studies. Granted, those semaglutide studies were, were longer as well. The next point that this person makes is they say, this is not a quick or cheap fix. It can take up to 16 weeks to find the right dose for you. And these drugs only work while you take them. So doctors and manufacturers recommend they are designed to be taken indefinitely, at least $1,000 a month. That's a big commitment that many insurers won't cover. So a few things here, the, again, I am not a medical doctor, but I work closely with them on this. It, you have to taper up in dose to get to a clinically effective dose that will actually result in, result in weight loss. You can't just go to a high dose of that exercise, of that medication. Um, that could definitely cause side effects. So it's just, this is just clinical practice. That's why it takes 16 weeks. It's not that they're just, oh, like, what's the right dose for you? It's, it's a tapering up procedure. And then these drugs only work when you take them. Okay. That is the, definitely the laziest argument against these medications. That's like saying headache, taking Tylenol only works when you take it. Yeah, of, of course. That's like saying blood pressure medication only works when you take it. It's just, it's just a lazy argument that doesn't make any sense. The $1,000 a month, that is a real argument. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid does not cover these medications. So that's a downside. It is uh, an expensive, it is an expensive medication if your insurance does not cover it. So that actually is, is true. Uh, the third point that this person makes is they are like every yo-yo diet out there. When you stop, you'll likely regain 66% of the weight you lost. Okay, so when we're evaluating some of these claims, we can either th say, are these claims just outright wrong, what this person is saying, or are they just totally not covering another form of important research research data. So let's look at this paper, which is called Maintenance of Weight Loss and Long-Term Management of Obesity. And so many people probably know this, it's extremely hard to keep the weight that you lost off anyways. So what I'm talking about here is there, you need to compare the medication to diet alone. So when you say it's just like any yo-yo diet out there, he's act, it's absolutely correct. So in a meta-analysis of 29 long-term uh, weight loss studies, more than half of the weight loss was regained within two years and five years more than 80% of lost weight was regained. So yeah, when people go off weight loss medications, they're more likely to increase their body weight. When people go off of diets, they're more likely to increase their body weight. So it's not any different than a traditional diet at all. So if, if you want a change to happen, you need to stick with these things. There's not enough research out there to basically say if people are on this medication, then they build up enough exercise habits or sufficient exercise habits, then they go off it. Are they able to keep keep that weight off? Um, if somebody has dealt with chronic obesity their entire life, then I'd say, why would you want to go off that medication anyways? It, many, many people that I speak with basically say, this is a game changer. I don't necessarily want to go off it. It's giving me complete control over my diet. The, the fourth point that this person makes is he says, they damage your metabolic health for every 1.5 pounds of fat lost with semaglutide, you'll lose one pound of muscle. Muscle is essential for metabolism, strength, and longevity. Plus, reduced muscle mass is correlated with increased mortality risk. So these are actually all um, true things, okay? But let's break this down. Now, he first talks about, he says, they damage your metabolic health, okay? But if you look at this study that he cites metabolic health is not just muscle. Muscle is important, but it's not just muscle. 
So if you look at this study, it says semaglutide was associated with a greater reductions from baseline than placebo in waist circumference. Um, it was uh, greater reductions in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Benefits favoring semaglutide were also noted with respect to changes in glycoly glycolated hemoglobin, fasting plasma glucose, C-reactive protein, and fasting lipid levels. So all also important indicators of, of metabolic health. Now, if you look at the amount of fat-free mass lost, he's, he's correct on this. This is from a, a secondary analysis on a small subsample that did a, a DEXA scan to get their, their body composition assessed. And overall in this group, the people that were on semaglutide lost 13.62 kilograms. And yeah, they lost about 39% of what they lost was from lean body mass, which is not uh, necessarily, it's not a great, it's not great. We want to preserve muscle when we're losing weight. That is uh, absolutely important. But what he's not stating is that it's not that different than diet alone without exercise. You need to do resistance training when you're losing weight if you want to spare muscle mass. So like I said earlier, I did a meta-analysis on all of the studies that compared diet only versus diet plus resistance training. And when you look at the, the studies that I pulled that resulted in clinically meaningful weight loss, meaning they lost at least 5% of their body weight, you'll see that the range in the loss, uh, the, the percent of loss from fat-free mass was anywhere between 13 to about 40, almost 46%. So the semaglutide trial, this, so those, what I just shared with you is uh, non-medicated weight loss. The semaglutide trial is most definitely up there on, on the high end, but if you look at this one study of resistance training or in 12 week protein supplemented, very low calorie diet treatment enhances weight loss outcome in obese patients. So if, if you look at the speed of weight loss, that also puts you at risk for increased muscle loss. In this case, this was about 46, almost half of what they lost came from, from losing lean mass. Now, yeah, it's an, it's a concern, but if you look at to the, to the right, when you look at the groups that were matched, but also included resistance training, the, the range is a lot lower. It can go anywhere from, from zero to it looks like about close to 19%. So it cuts, it cuts that number in about half if you're including resistance training. And then probably what I would say here is cherry picking of, of information. Now he's talking about semaglutide. That's just one different type of a GLP-1 medication. If we look at an earlier GLP-1 medication called liraglutide, we could look at this paper, which is called Healthy Weight Loss Maintenance with Exercise Liraglutide or Combined. So in this study, there's a placebo group. Uh, there was a liraglutide group. That's the GLP-1 medication. There was an exercise group and then a um, exercise plus liraglutide group. And what you see here is that people that uh, exercise and were on liraglutide actually um, did not really have a significant impact on, on their fat-free mass, so or on their lean mass, which is shown here in this image. So yeah, it's you will lose lean mass if you don't exercise when you're losing weight. There might be a little bit of a signal uh, here with semaglutide, but if you do resistance training, that's gonna dramatically cut that down. What he doesn't mention too is that many, many, many people in this study report improvements in in physical functioning. Now, the fifth point that this person makes is the side effects are awful, insert poop emoji, which is kind of funny. 84% of participants reported GI side effects such as constant nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or constipation. That doesn't sound like something fun to sign up to for life. So let's look at um, just one study. I'll go to the study that he's referencing, but in the, in the probably the main most popular uh, semaglutide study. They look at safety and side effect profiles and they say similar percentage of participants in the semaglutide and placebo groups reported adverse events, 89.7% and 86.4% respectively. Gastrointestinal disorders, typically nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, and constipation were the most frequently reported events and occurred in more participants receiving semaglutide than those the placebo, 74.2% versus 47.9%. 
Now, here's the important part. Most gastrointestinal events were mild to moderate in severity, were transient and resolved without permanent discontinuation of the regimen. So yeah, when you go up in dose or the day after you take your medication, you're gonna be more likely to report side effects. That's not to downplay side effects. Um, I have heard people that have had side effects that I wouldn't want either, but it's not, um, severe side effects are not common. So from the study that he was referencing, which was the effects of weekly subcutaneous semaglutide versus daily liraglutide on body weight in adults with overweight and obesity without diabetes. So if you look at the adverse events that this person was referencing, they say, Adverse events were reported by 95.2% of participants with semaglutide, 96.1% with liraglutide, and 95.3% with placebo. Gastrointestinal disorders were the most frequent adverse events with semaglutide and liraglutide, reported by 84.1%, that's what he's referencing, and 82.7% of participants, respectively. The placebo group still had 55.3%. Uh, more events occurred with semaglutide than liraglutide. Most gastrointestinal events were mild to moderate in severity. So things like gas, um, and let's just see what else here. Oh yeah, this is the other important part. Reports of gastrointestinal adverse events were greatest during and shortly after dose escalation with mild events persisting throughout the trial. So mild, not, not necessarily even moderate or severe. The next point that this person makes, he says, we don't know how safe they are. Ozempic has a black box warning from the FDA due to potential cause, cause specific types of thyroid tumors and thyroid cancer. Remember, studies on semaglutide for weight loss have only been run for two years thus far. We don't truly know the long-term effects. Okay, this is just, it's just dumb because if you look at the trial, the trial started in 2018, it's 2024, maybe he's just not good at math or something like that. And then if you look at semaglutide, it was approved for type two diabetes in 2017 by the FDA, which means that studies needed to be conducted before 2017. So I'm just not, maybe he's just not good at math, but in this case, I, I get it. Um, if you're trying to sell your your product, or weight loss behavioral coaching product, you still need to do all those behavior things. But instead of thinking us versus them, it's how can these medications, this is what I've experienced, how can these medications help people to do the behaviors that they know are good for them? Uh, I talk to so many people that say, look, I, I now feel in control of my diet and so I'm ready to include exercise. Um, so I actually consider this to be something that's extremely helpful for opening up a door for more people to, to get involved in exercise. And it's just not helpful for people to put out this fear mongering and stuff like that when they clearly have no idea what they're talking about and they can be easily refuted just by reading the papers um, that they tend to reference. So just referencing science doesn't make you a scientist. Uh, I hope that this was helpful and uh, please subscribe and uh, watch some of my exercise videos.